Welcome to the podcast of Grace Community Bible Church. We hope and pray that you are blessed, challenged, and inspired by this message. For other sermons or more information, visit us at gracebiblechurch.org.au. One of my professors in seminary, uh, who has since died, uh, he told us uh, about how his father came to know the Lord. See, uh, this professor of mine, he had become a Christian at a young age. And after he became a Christian, he shared the gospel with his mother and she uh, became a Christian. But his father, on the other hand, were, did not respond rightly to the gospel. He, he was always opposed to the gospel, or at least for a long time. And many years later, when his father was in his 80s, somewhere in his mid-80s almost, one day he listens to the gospel message by Billy Graham as he turned on the television, and he turned and accepted the Lord, and he bowed the knee to Jesus, and he became a Christian that day. And he lived as a Christian. His life was transformed from that day, and he lived for another few years, and then he died. And, and, and I remember my professor relating this story to us to talk about how powerful the gospel is and how he can use um, people, even frail people, to soften hard hearts to himself. You see, God had in his sovereignty used the life of my professor who was young at the time, many years of that Christian life together with the life of this man's uh, wife, who was a Christian as well, to soften his heart over the years, to a point where when he finally heard the gospel, he readily accepted it and submitted his life to Jesus. These past few weeks, we've been going through First Peter, and he's been reminding us of the powerful influence, the powerful testimony, the powerful impact that a Christian testimony can have on the lives of unbelievers. You see, Peter wants his readers and even us to understand that the Christian life is not simply about, oh, I believe in Jesus and I trust in Jesus and I will go to heaven and that's the end of it and nothing else matters. Oh no, Peter says, Peter says, Fundamentally, understand Christ, to understand Christianity, you need to understand that you are a chosen foreigner. It means that you are chosen by God, but it also means that everything in this world, your relationship with this world has changed. But Peter then to encourage us says, yeah, you're, you're living in this state of already and not yet. You have salvation, you've been saved, but there's an ultimate fulfillment of that reality that's coming. And th that'll be precious when Jesus comes. And then he says, so because you are saved, because you're children of God, you need to live a certain way. And what that means is you don't just live individually as Christians, but you live collectively together as a people of God. And there's a huge evangelistic purpose in this as well. And the purpose is this, to proclaim the excellencies of this great God who has called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. And then also to live a life that commends this gospel, that commends the excellencies of this great God. And so... And that's what we've been looking at, this life that commenced the gospel, this Christian testimony. And he comes to this final section now in verses 8 through to 12, and, and he wants to continue to motivate us to live this life, to maintain our Christian testimony. And what he's going to do is he's going to tell us this, two things that you need to keep in mind as you think of maintaining your Christian testimony. Firstly, he says, you need to keep in mind the necessity of a godly life. And, and that we'll see in verses 8 and 9. 
And secondly, he's going to talk to us about the motivation of that godly life in verses 10 to 12. So firstly, let's look at, in order to maintain our testimony, let's look at the necessity of a godly life. Let's look at verse 8 first. He says, finally, all of you have unity of mind, sympathy, brotherly love, a tender heart, and a humble mind. See, Peter is bringing to conclusion everything that he has said from verses from chapter 2, verse 11 uh, to chapter 3, verse 7 that we looked at last week. And remember that general principle of abstaining from evil and keeping an honorable life in front of the unbelieving world. That is the Christian duty. It has, it has a huge evangelistic purpose. It involves every sphere of your life. How you respond to the government. How you respond to your personal authorities. How slaves respond to masters how wives and husbands respond to each other in marriage. See, all this is to maintain that Christian testimony, that powerful Christian influence to those around you, to impact those people around you. And here's the conclusion of it all. He says, finally, all of you, He's no, no longer singling out people as citizens or slaves or masters or wives or husbands. He's saying, all of you, all of you who are members of the whole church, everyone without exception, here's what you need to do. See, here's what you need to do as a church if you are going to stand firm in this world and maintain that collective witness. This is the kind of behavior that you need to have within the church. This is the behavior within the church that will commend the gospel, that will help you to continue to stand firm and be that collective witness in this world. He says, firstly, you need to have a unity of mind. And really the, the, the five things that he mentions here, unity of mind, sympathy, brotherly love, tender heart, and humble mind, there, there's a structure in the original language. Really, unity of mind and humble mind, they go together. They're paired together. And sympathy and tender heart, they go together. And at the center of it, that's the focal point, that is brotherly love. That's what he's going to get at. So let's look at these pairs one by one. First he says, you need to have as a church a, a unity of mind. A like-mindedness. A common mindset. You see, it's... This common mindset, it's, it's not the idea that in every minute detail, in, you know, in your opinions, in matters of conscience and all that, you're all going to be like carbon copies of each other. You're just going to be exactly alike, like, like clones walking around. No, he's saying with regards to important things, you are going to have the same mind. You need to have the same mind. Concerning the, the, the core things and, and the purposes and goals, there's a sameness of mind. Well, starting with the Word of God. That that's the, the, the common authority within the church. There's no other authority. It's not opinion of man. It is the authority of God's Word that is going to govern us. And we recognize the authority of God's Word. And everything that we do is, flows out of what we know that God's word says. See, I could put it like this, or more simply. Ultimately, what he's saying is, 
it comes down to having the same mind with regards to the gospel. With regards to those core issues, you have to have the same mind. So there's the doctrinal aspect of it. But also then, in how that gospel works out in your life, in the way you live your life. A life that will then commend this gospel. That in terms of purpose, in terms of goal, how we are to live together as a church, we have the same goal, the same mindset, the same purpose to make much of Jesus Christ, to follow in his pattern and to make much of him and to make much of the gospel. You see, there, there are differences even amongst us in the way we think, in, in perhaps how we bring up families, in how we just do different things and matters of conscience. We come from different cultural backgrounds. We, uh, there's so many differences between us. And yet Peter's point is, let those differences, that shouldn't come in between that being in harmony, being united. No, what should, what should bring you together is the gospel. Gospel uh, thinking in matters of doctrine and in matters of living. That that's what's binding you and there's a, the, the, there's a common mindset with regards to that, that it's all about the gospel and nothing else. Why is Peter saying this? In fact, you, you see this call to live in harmony in other, other letters as well, even letters written by Paul. Why? It's precisely because there's differences and there's sin in our lives. That there, when there's trials within the church, when there's trials outside, there's opposition from outside coming into the church as well. What happens? We suddenly, that common mindset, we, we forget that it, it's all about the gospel. And so he's saying here, you need to have that same mindset that it's about God's word and the gospel and living a life that reflects that. It's about making much of Jesus Christ and what he's done. And Peter's saying, this is essential with regards to you being part of the church in terms of you building up the church and standing firm and having that gospel identity and influence in this world. So, le so let me ask you, do your actions, attitude, do they contribute to the harmony of the church based on the gospel? That despite our differences, this, this is what binds us and so we're going to live like this with this same mindedness. Peter says this is essential. Secondly, he says, be humble. Be humble and not prideful. That's the, the pair that goes with being of the same mind. Don't just look after number one. You see, sometimes we think, you know, humble mind, where other parts of Scripture says, you know, to have a lowly mind. Sometimes we think that that means to kind of think badly about ourselves. No, that, that's not what Scripture means by having a humble mind. In fact, then, then a person who is very depressed would be the most humble person in the world. No, the, the idea is, it, it's not thinking badly of oneself, but the, real, the, the, the idea of humility is really not thinking about self. See, because even a depressed person, ultimately, the focus is on self. 
I'm unworthy, I, I, or I, I, you know, I don't know what and all that. It's still a focus on self, but humility is, is not thinking about self. How do we get that? It's when we view ourselves rightly again when we think about the gospel in light of the salvation that God has given us. I, I, I didn't deserve to be a child of God. I'm, I'm unworthy to be his child and be part of his household. And I realize that everybody around me is in the same boat. They're sinners, but they're sinners saved by grace. And so now I'm freed up not to think more highly of myself, but to think about God and to think about Jesus Christ and that it's all about the gospel and I'm freed up to serve others, to be others-oriented and not me-oriented. That it's not about what I want, it's about what God wants, and it's about commending the gospel. So Peter says, that's the second thing that we need to have to maintain that gospel witness. So that's the first pair, unity of mind and humbleness. Then the next pair is sympathy and tenderheartedness. The word there, sympathy, it has the idea of sharing the same feelings. See, it's the idea that we care care for each other so much there's a readiness to to enter into that other person's experience of things in their joys in their sorrows you know it, it's it's what we read in Romans 12:15 where it says rejoice with those who rejoice and mourn with those who mourn you're you're entering into their experiences. You care for them so much, and, and you're sharing that with them. Or as First Corinthians twelve twenty six says, if one member suffers, all suffer together. If one member is honored, all rejoice together. See what that means is, or the implication there is this that we don't have these very distant, superficial relationships. Now, how do, how do we enter and care for each other like this? Only if our relationships are like this. As we share life with each other, that we know what's going on in each other's lives, and, and we support each other this way. We support each other, and we're so touched this way, that somebody else's experience becomes our experience and we, we continue to encourage each other this way. Now I know in our church we are growing in this and I praise God for this. But let's think of, okay, how can we do this better? How can we keep growing in this? Where we're sympathetic towards one another. Where we're, we're having such concern and care for one another, rejoicing with one another and mourning with one another. And closely related to this, the, the other term is tender heartedness. It can also be translated as compassion or kind-heartedness, to be compassionate or to be kind-hearted. Again, it's, it's that idea closely related to sympathy where you're feeling for the other person and, and you want to act for that person's good. There's a, there's a kind or tender-heartedness, a, a softness 
to the other person. As opposed to having a hard heart. Oh, they're not like me. They're so different from me. You know, they think so different to me. Or they come from a different cultural background. Or, or they have so many problems and I don't. Or I have lots of problems and, and they don't. Or he's too young or she's too old. No, n- none of that. There's no hard-heartedness like that. But there's a tender-heartedness, a soft-heartedness. Uh, there's a warmth to that other person of, of care and love, not callous and hard-heartedness. I'm not concerned about what you're going through or what's happening in your life. You know, Ephesians 4.32, there the same word is used there of being tender-hearted or being compassionate. And this is in the context of being tender to those who sin against you. Saying, in response, you need to be tender-hearted and and forgiving. So even in that context, when we sin against each other, that we're not harsh with each other, but we are being tender-hearted to one another. And then finally, the the apex of this is brotherly love. That's at the very center of it. He says, we are to love each other this way, with a brotherly love. Meaning what? Meaning we don't see ourselves as strangers. We don't see ourselves as just, just, just acquaintances or even distant relatives you know, who are not concerned about each other, but as close family members. Why? Because we have the same Father. We have Jesus Christ who is our older brother and, and we belong to the same family that we actually are brothers and sisters. And for all of eternity, we will be brothers and sisters. So that we treat each other this way, we love each other with this familial love, that we are family, not strangers, not acquaintances, but we are family because of what God has done through Jesus Christ. See, and so what that means is even when we have disagreements, even when we sin against each other, we forgive each other and we say we're family. We, we, we don't just walk out just like that. No, we're committed to each other. And we say, no, we're family. God has made us this way as one family. And Peter's point is, see, this is the, 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 the big point with all these virtues that he's talking about. Why? Because this kind of love is such a supernatural love. And everything that's mentioned here, to have that same goal and purpose, because it's all about the gospel, humble, not thinking about self, oriented towards others, Compassionate, tender-hearted, sympathetic, having brotherly love. Remember in John it says, they will know that you are my disciples in the way you, what? Love one another. In the way you love one another, they will know that you are my disciples. See, this, this kind of supernatural love where, where the world outside is looking and saying, I just 
cannot understand how those people love each other like this. There's something different, something so special about this. I can't understand how such an old man from this culture is so friendly with this young gentleman and they have nothing in common, at least from a worldly sense. It, it, it's, I can't explain it. But it is attractive. It is winsome. You see, and what this does is when the church becomes like this and lives like this, People on the outside are going to look at, they're the most loved people because they say their God loves them and look at the way they love each other. I, I, I want to experience that love. I want to be part of that group too. I want to know their God. When you think of who Peter is writing to, and when you think of you know, all the different scenarios that he brought up the last few weeks, there's slaves, a good chunk of them may have been slaves. There most likely would have been some masters in the church as well. Maybe some government officials. Wives and husbands. Wives who are married to unbelievers. Husbands as well. So many different scenarios, so many economic, socioeconomic differences as well. So, so, so many differences and difficulties they're going through in life. So, when you th- think about that, Peter is saying, don't let that adversity and those differences tear you apart. No, you need to. Come together and live like this because this is the the collective witness of the church. And this is how you're going to stand firm as you build each other this way. And not only for you to stand firm in this hostile world, that evangelistic uh, impact as well, that gospel impact as well as you live like this. Stay together. Do life together. Even when life gets hard, don't run away from each other. And if it means that you've got an issue with a brother or sister, then you will make it your topmost priority to to sort it out. Why? Because the gospel is at stake. Because that's why we live together like this to make much of the gospel, to make much of Jesus Christ. And so I would say this. I need you to live like this. And you need me to live like this to you. And as we live this way, as God's people, as a church, within the church, as our behavior is like this, and we build each other up this way, we become a wonderful collective witness of God can do to a bunch of sinners. So that's life within the church. Now he moves on to... so. What does then this life look like when you go outside, when you interact with unbelievers? Look at verse 9. He says, Don't repay evil for evil or reviling for reviling, but on the contrary, bless. For to this you were called that you may obtain a blessing. Now this doesn't mean that bad things can't happen to you within the church. But when you think of the overall context, when you think of the fact that Peter is writing to Christians in how to deal with the opposition they're facing from the world, 
He's quite likely talking about how to deal with the world now. So what he's saying is to maintain your testimony, it matters not just how you treat your fellow brothers and sisters, it also matters how you treat unbelievers, those who even treat you poorly. He says, don't repay evil for evil or reviling for reviling. This is talking about evil deeds and reviling, and that's offensive speech or insults or, or mocking. See, he says, don't repay evil for evil. Think of it like this. Someone's done a work and you have to pay that person. You have to give that person what he deserves. Peter is saying, when someone does a work of evil to you, don't repay him with evil. Don't give him back what he deserves. Don't retaliate. Don't seek vengeance. You've done this evil to me, now I'm going to come after you and take revenge. Seek vengeance. And you're going to pay for what you've done. No, we shouldn't do that. We shouldn't repay with more of the same. Instead, Peter says, we repay evil with blessing. We repay cursing with blessing, evil with good. That's how we get even as Christians to those who do evil to us. Yeah, I'm going to get you back. How am I going to get you back? By blessing you. And the blessing here, it's, it's not just doing good with you know, kind words. But it's more so the idea of invoking God's favor, that God would forgive that person and, and even save that person. So it's, it's on a much greater way of blessing that person. Now you might say, but, but that's, that's unnatural. I mean, that's not what the person deserves for treating me so bad. That's exactly the point. See, what is natural and possible for everyone to do is this. Retaliate when wronged. Return evil for evil. Everyone does that. But for Christians, our response is different. We don't retaliate. Instead, we repay evil with blessing, even asking God's favor upon that person. See, only a person who is supernaturally saved can do this. Someone who's been given that supernatural ability to respond this way to evil attacks. Remember, a couple of weeks ago, we saw that this is what Christ has done through his death on the cross when we were healed. To die to sin and live in righteousness, to live this way. Only a Christian, a supernaturally saved person can respond this way. You know, we've all heard of stories where a loved one of a Christian was killed somehow by another person. And that Christian goes to that person and says, I forgive you. And even shares the gospel with that person. That's an example of returning blessing for the evil done. And this is following the example of Christ. And we saw a couple of weeks ago from 1 Peter 2, 21 to 24 that you know, he did not retaliate when he was treated harshly. Instead, what did he do? He kept entrusting himself to, to the Father, God who will judge all evildoers one day. He kept entrusting himself to God the judge. And, and beyond that, 
Remember on the cross? After he was, after he was tortured and, and whipped and mocked and spat upon and was crucified on that cross. How does he respond from the cross? Does he now retaliate? No, he does not, not only not retaliate, he blesses the people around. What does he say? Father, forgive them. Forgive these very people who have done evil to me. He blessed them by asking for God's favor and forgiveness. And remember, uh, even on the cross, there were two thieves on the cross. One of them is watching Jesus all along and how he's responding. And what happened? Finally, that hard heart of his melts. And he sees Jesus for who he is. And he responds positively to Jesus. And he submits to Jesus. And Jesus says to him, today you will be with me in paradise. So as Christians who follow the example of Jesus, we should respond the same way. Repay evil with blessing. Why? Because we have been supernaturally saved and we have been given now the ability to reflect the very character of Christ. Nobody else can act this way. That's why we should live this way. And look, and that's why Peter explains in the last part of verse 9, for to this you were called that you may obtain a blessing. He's saying, God has called you. He's called you out and he's, he's saved you to live this kind of supernatural life. You were called this way to, to finally obtain or inherit a blessing. What is this saying? Is this saying if you do good to your enemies that you will be saved? No. This blessing is not something that you earn. Notice, it says uh, it's something that you obtain, or it can also be translated something you inherit. Something that you inherit is always a gift. It's not something that you earn. That would be a wage. See, God called us out to inherit his blessing of, of forgiveness and eternal life with him because of what Jesus has done. We didn't earn this. We didn't deserve to be saved. We didn't deserve to be assured of the fact that ultimately we'll receive even that final blessing, that final salvation of life with him. We didn't deserve any of this. No, you and I, we reviled against God. We sinned against Him. We rebelled against Him. We suppressed the truth about Him so we could continue to live in our sin. We were opposed to God. We were hostile to God. We blasphemed His name and made a mockery of Him. And yet, how did God treat us? He didn't give us what we deserved. Which is his wrath. No, he blessed us. By giving us his son and sacrificing him on that cross. He blessed us, we who were his enemies. He blessed us by forgiving us of our sins and, for, and by giving us eternal life with him. And ultimately, that blessing will be fully realized one day when Christ returns. But he has so blessed us. So why should we Bless our enemies. Why should we repay evil with blessing? 
Because this is how God has treated us. I mean, what evil has been done to us that is greater than the evil that we have done against God? So when we think about the gospel, when we remember what God has done for us in Christ, then we say, of course, this is how we should respond when we are treated with opposition, when evil is done to us. Why? Because this kind of response is not natural. But it is the response of a child of God. It is the response of somebody who's truly been blessed by God. It is one of the strongest testimonies of the supernatural work of the gospel of Jesus Christ as we live this way. And it is evidence that we are children of God who are being transformed from the inside out. So let me ask you as I ask myself this question. Do you respond this way when people insult you, mock you, or do evil to you? Now if you're discouraged thinking I, I fail so often in this area when, when people do evil to me when they insult me. Let me encourage you to, to remember the gospel and what God has done through Jesus Christ. Keep that in mind every single day and then intentionally make it your aim to live this way as you depend on the Holy Spirit. And even though there will be times that you'll fail, and those times you need to ask God for forgiveness, but as you're intentional about living this way, of repaying evil with blessing, God will grow you through this. He will give you the ability to reflect Christ more and more this way as you regularly bring to mind the gospel. See, this is so critical for us to live this way. Both from the standpoint of helping us stand firm in this hostile world, and for us to be assured that we are children of God, whose life is being changed as we respond this way, but also, also to know that it is one of the powerful ways by which God will use your life and my life to soften hard hearts to himself. So that's the necessity of a godly life. That's why it's so important to live that godly life. Now very quickly, the motivation for a godly life. In verses 10 to 12, Peter is quoting from Psalm 34, 12 to 16. And we read that earlier in our Bible reading. And the reason Peter is quoting from this psalm is because this, this psalm is about how God will deliver his people who suffer. But here's the thing though. His people, by trusting in him, will suffer in a righteous way by not returning evil for evil. In fact, it's the very evidence that they are people of God. And so Peter is saying, I want you to think of this passage from Psalm 34 because the same principle applies to you. Verse 10, it says, For or because, this prince, think of this principle from Scripture, and he quotes, Whoever desires to love life, meaning to, 
whoever desires to enjoy life and see good days, days that are beneficial and not empty and vain. See, if one wishes to live the good life, the the blessed life, no, this good life is not talking about a life without any problems. Now, Peter is writing to churches and Christians who are facing opposition and, and problems everywhere. So this is, not a prob- this is not a promise that problems in life will disappear. No, it's talking about the enjoyment of life, the, the goodness of life, in the sense of a life that is happy, a life that is satisfied, a, a life that is content, regardless of the circumstance. And, and, and who desires this kind of life, this content life, this, this satisfied life regardless of circumstance? It's the people of God. It's only the people of God that will desire this kind of life. You know, and so... This life comes from being born again. It comes from becoming a child of God. And in an ultimate sense, we will experience the the blessing and goodness of this life when Christ returns. That ultimate reality will happen. But still, even now, we can experience the goodness of this life, the enjoyment of this life even now. But we need to live a certain way. Our life needs to prove that we are children of God. And the way we do that is how we suffer when injustice or evil is done to us. And so Peter says, he recounts things. He says, first we need to control our tongue. See, the people of God are people who control their tongue. We, we don't slander, we don't attack, we don't mock others, we don't speak in a way that cuts others to keep them in check. We don't speak deceit, we don't deceive anyone to flatter them or manipulate someone to, to get what we want. We're not that kind of people. No, we, we are people who control our tongues and we need to live this way. Why? Because out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. And if our mouth is not controlled, it means that our heart is not controlled. But we are people whose hearts are being transformed. And we have the ability to control our heart. And so we need to live this way. So first thing he says is we are people who control our tongues. And secondly, In verse 11, he says, let him turn away from evil and do good. He says we should make a conscious effort as we depend on God to turn away from evil, to repent of any evil. And in this context is is treating others sinfully. We need to repent and turn away from that. And then positively, do good. We need to make a conscious effort to do this, to not treat others sinfully, but instead positively seek to do good to others. Again, this is supernatural. This is evidence that we are children of God. And then lastly, He says we need to seek peace and pursue it. We need to aggressively, intentionally seek to be at peace with everyone, even those who do evil to us. Now this doesn't mean that we compromise on the truth of God's word to, you know, in order to have peace. No, it's similar to what Romans 12, 17 to 18 says, repay no one evil for evil, but give thought to what is honorable in the sight of all. If possible, so far as it depends on you, live peaceably 
with all. See, as much as it depends on us, even with those who are evil towards us, we will seek and pursue peace with that person intentionally. See, this is how we experience that blessed life, the goodness of this life that God has already given us as Christians. And then he gives a greater motivation to live in this righteous way in verses 12. He says, for the eyes of the Lord are on the righteous. Who are the righteous? The righteous are the ones who live this way. Who don't repay evil for evil, but they do good. People who control their mouth because they control their hearts. People who pursue peace and are not divisive people. So who are these righteous people? They're God's children. Only God's children live this way. And he says, no, there's those of you who are righteous, who live this kind of righteous life, who are children of God, know this, the eyes of the Lord are on you. Meaning the, the Lord's favor, his care, his love is on you. I mean, the first century Christians were going through a lot for living as a Christian. And even us, as we live in this world, we go through opposition and it's only going to get worse. But when we live as his children in this way, Scripture says, understand the Lord is watching over you. He knows all that is going on in your life. And he's in control of it all. But he will never do anything to harm you. No, his care and his favor is on you. And understand that and remember that. And not only that he watches over you, but he also hears you as his children. Notice it says, his ears are open to their prayers. He's attentive to our prayers. See, he knows what we need. And when we cry out to him, he will answer. He will give us what we need. He's like a good father who provides for his children everything that they need. And so what this should do is it should encourage us to then further depend on God. To spend more time in prayer, crying out to him, seeking after him, knowing that he will answer prayer and he will give us all that we need and only that we need. But in contrast, last part of verse 12, the face of the Lord is against those who do evil, is against those who persecute you. He's against those who mock you and do evil things to you. See, God's face is turned away from them. He's opposed to them. His wrath, instead of his favor, is on them, is on those who do evil. See, God is very serious about sin. Just have to look at the cross. His beloved son on the cross for our sake. And when he took on himself our sin, God turned his face away. That's how serious he is about sin. And so he's encouraging us as his children in two ways. On the one side, he's saying, so don't live like the world. You need to live as my children. This is the evidence that you're my children. You're controlling your tongue, repaying a blessing for the evil that comes to you. 
pursuing peace and you're living like this because I take sin seriously because of and you can understand that when you think of what I've done to my son but at the same time I know it is difficult I care for you and I love for you and I'm watching over you and I will answer and give you everything that you need but for those of you them who are persecuting you my face is against them and I will deal with them but in the meantime continue to live this way because this is also part of my plan and my will as you live this way even those people that are opposing you some of them watching you live like this will have their hearts softened and they will respond to the gospel and they will be my people as well and they will join you this is my purpose and this is my will so god's posture towards those who do evil is that he will at one point deal with them his face is opposed to them but as his children we need to always remember god's tender eye is on us and he cares for us and he listens to our every need and we will experience the the blessing of god's favor as we live as his children as he calls us to live a certain way but you know what it's not just that when we live like this even in the midst of hostility god is then going to use our lives yes our weak frail lives as his instruments to draw more people to himself and so peter says continue to maintain your christian testimony all of you let's close in prayer father we thank you for the great god you are we thank you for the way that you teach us we thank you for the way that you guide us we thank you how with compassion and with kindness and with rebuke uh in so many different ways by warnings and by blessings you keep us on this path so that you would get all the glory and so that we would experience all the blessing of living as your children help us to understand that help us to live this way help us to want to honor you this way as a result grow us in our love for you father and help us to have that same heart for lost people as you have just like you had a heart for us and you saved us and and use us as your instruments to draw more people to yourself this we pray in Jesus name amen